What's up everybody? I'm Lee with Adaptable Wealth and in today's video we'll be covering eight strategies that we can use to deal with the volatility in financial markets so that we can lock in our gains, limit our losses, and sleep better at night. Ready? Let's kick it off. We're in the midst of some pretty volatile times. We have ongoing bank failures, inflation is eating away at our hard-earned wealth, there's wars on multiple fronts, politics and ideology are splitting countries apart, and there's a slow but persistent push by multiple countries to move away from the US dollar as the world reserve currency. Fortunately, there are several strategies that you can employ to limit to a certain extent the volatility in your portfolio during these volatile times. The most commonly advised strategy is to simply do nothing. Patience and discipline is the name of the game here. If you're younger than 55, it's probably best that you maintain a long-term focus and stay invested. You might want to make a few tweaks here and there in order to reduce the risk in your portfolio, but for the most part, you want to stick to your long-term financial plan. Having said that, there are several offensive and defensive strategies that we can employ to navigate market turbulence. Let's start with the defensive strategies. These strategies are designed to not only reduce the likelihood of a drop in the value of your portfolio, but to limit the magnitude of the drawdown as well. The first strategy is diversification. Diversification is the process of spreading your financial wealth across many lowly or non-correlated assets for the purpose of reducing the volatility of your returns without materially impacting the overall returns of your portfolio. Now, I'm not talking about diversification again across sector, style, or market cap. I'm talking about the diversification across asset classes and geography. The most recent research by Morningstar on diversification demonstrates that sector, style, and market cap are not that good at reducing correlations in a portfolio. It's the diversification across asset classes that offers the most benefit. If you're interested in reading that report, I've left a link in the description below. The asset classes that generally do well in times of high volatility are cash, which includes cash sitting in a high yield savings account, or short-term treasury bills with maturities of two years or less. These are the best volatility suppressing investments that there are. While short-term treasury bills pay you 5% right now and will experience literally zero volatility unless the United States bond market collapses, which I see as very unlikely in the next couple of years, these two investments offer no upside in terms of price appreciation. A solution to this is to go a little farther out on the yield curve and hold some longer-term notes and bonds with maturities of two years all the way up to 30 years. Remember, the price of a bond is inversely correlated to interest rates, which means that if interest rates start to fall, the price of your bonds are likely to rise and vice versa. If history is any indication, the Fed is going to hold interest rates at these elevated levels until something breaks. And once something breaks, asset prices will start to fall, the Fed will start cutting rates, which means there's going to be a flood of money into safe assets like these treasury notes and bonds, and the prices of those investments will rise. So you'll have a portion of your portfolio falling while the value of your bonds are likely to rise, creating this counterbalancing effect that can help stabilize the value of your whole portfolio. In fact, the Morningstar research that I referred to earlier still pinpoints bonds as the best and easiest way to diversify a portfolio. There is one big caveat to these longer term bonds though. As we just saw in 2022, inflation can cause interest rates to rise and stock prices to fall at the same time. So if we get persistent or rising inflation, which I suspect that we're going to, these bonds will offer no protection against declining asset prices. This is why I'm currently hanging out in six month treasury bills, collecting my 5% and happily reducing the volatility in my portfolio. Next is residential real estate and farmland. With both of these assets, you can get paid to hold them if you rent them out or you produce something sellable on the land. You can also get price appreciation and tax benefits on top of the income. Farmland, in particular, has always been a bulwark of price stability with only a couple of exceptions during the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl that followed shortly thereafter. If you're interested in learning about residential real estate or farmland, I did a deep dive on those investments a little while ago. You can find the links to those videos in the description below. Lastly, we have gold. Gold is a tough one. On one hand, it's a good hedge against the devaluation of fiat currencies, 
uh, and during politically volatile times, and it has been for thousands of years. On the other hand, the returns are pretty darn poor compared to stocks and real estate. It doesn't pay any income, and it can go absolutely nowhere or even be down 10 to 15% for long periods of time before going on a multi-year bull run like we're seeing right now. After diversification, the next strategy for handling market volatility is to focus on quality, consistency, and the return of your capital rather than the return on your capital. The next strategy is to rebalance your portfolio. You don't want to get your asset allocation mix too skewed towards any one asset class unless you're making an informed bet and are intentionally overweighting in a specific asset. Your allocation can get too skewed if one or more of your assets significantly outperform the other assets that you hold, and this is when you want to rebalance. Of course, what qualifies as too skewed is based on each individual's circumstances. I personally don't think that a 65 or 70% allocation to stocks is too skewed, but 90% is. On the other hand, you may think that a 50% allocation to any one asset is too skewed. Whatever asset allocation mix you're comfortable with, try to keep it as steady as possible by rebalancing regularly. To rebalance, you simply sell a little bit of your winners and reallocate that money to other assets that you hold so that you maintain your desired allocation. The next strategy is to set up a stop loss order which tells your brokerage the exact price at which you would want them to automatically take your shares to market. This can help limit losses and can be used to protect gains. For example, let's say you bought Visa stock at 275 bucks and you want to limit any potential losses to 10 bucks per share. You simply set up a stop loss order with your brokerage at 265 bucks and if the price drops to that level, your brokerage will automatically try to sell those shares as close to 265 bucks as possible. Or maybe the price of the stock goes up to 325 and you'd like to lock in some gains by selling those shares if the price falls down to 300. There is one big downside to stop losses though. They don't guarantee that you will get a specific price for your shares. Once the stop loss price is hit, a market sell order is triggered, which means that your brokerage will take those shares to market and get the highest possible price at that point in time. The problem is during times of extreme fear and selling, markets can quickly drop by large chunks at a time. This means that once your stop loss price is hit, it is possible that the market price is already 10 or even $20 per share lower than your stop loss price. But because you instructed your brokerage to sell those shares at whatever the market price is, they're going to be sold at that lower price whether you'd want to or not. In order to guarantee an exact price for selling your shares, you'd have to use our next strategy, which is to buy put options. Put options act like insurance on the value of an asset that you already hold. A put option gives you the option to sell an asset at a pre-specified price by a pre-specified date. So if the price of an asset that you hold drops below the agreed upon strike price, then the value of that option increases as the price of the asset that you own falls. You get an offsetting effect and a stabilization in the value of your portfolio, just like we talked about when we discussed bonds. The only problem with put options is that most options expire every single week, so you got to keep pumping money into them if you want to maintain that insurance. You could choose a longer time horizon, but you'll have to pay significantly more to maintain that longer term insurance. Also, please like this video and subscribe to the channel. It's the easiest and a free way that you can help me grow this channel if you find this content valuable. Now let's take a look at the offensive strategies. First, we have dollar cost averaging. This strategy has you buying when prices fall. You could have a cash position where you're earning 5% on short-term treasuries or on cash in a high yield savings account so that when prices fall, you can buy at the lower prices. Or you could set it up so that you're buying at pre-specified intervals regardless of what's going on in the market. This is what most people mean when they refer to dollar cost averaging. If you have a 401k that you're contributing to, then you're dollar cost averaging whether you realize it or not. Dollar cost averaging is just another way of saying buy regardless of price. Is there anything else other than basic survival needs that you buy regardless of price? It sounds ridiculous when I say it like that, I know, but it's worked surprisingly well over the last 100 years due primarily to the fact that the US dollar became the world reserve currency and capital has flooded into our financial markets as a result. 
The other offensive strategy is to buy VIX ETFs. The VIX is an index that gauges the market's future volatility. Higher VIX levels indicate increased market uncertainty and almost always correspond with a drop in the price of stocks. The theory goes that you buy shares in the ETF and if volatility jumps and stock prices fall, the price of the shares of the VIX fund that you own will rise and offset to an extent the drop uh, in stocks so that you get that offsetting effect that we've referred to multiple times throughout this video. These are by no means safe investments that you would hold for the long term like stocks. They are used more for a short term bet that volatility will spike. And there you have it, eight strategies for reducing the volatility in your portfolio. If you have any questions, ideas for my next video, or if you'd like me to dig deeper into one of the topics that we discussed in this video, please leave a comment below. Also, please like this video and subscribe to the channel. It's the easiest and a free way that you can help me grow this channel if you find this content valuable. Until next time, you all take care and remember, wealth is not only about money and things, your time and health are just as important and working to improve all three pillars of wealth is key to being adaptable, resilient, and thriving in life.